The Corinth Gulf is one of the most neurotectonically and seismically active regions of the Mediterranean, constituting a post-alpine tectonic basin. The area between Ireon and Alepohori is particularly significant due to the presence of a series of normal faults, which causes some coastal areas to uplift and others to submerge. How can we identify in the field past tectonic movements and relative sea level changes? Fossil paleo shorelines in general can be identified and traced from geomorphological, biological, uh, sedimentological, from, from stratigraphical, or archaeological sea level indicators. Amongst the various sea level indicators, tidal notches are worth a special mention as they can indicate formal sea level positions with up to a decimeter confidence. The profile of a tidal notch provides information on the duration in which mean sea level remained at the level of the notch vertex. Tidal notches are erosional with littoral marks left by sea level, especially on limestone coastal cliffs. In the mid-littoral zone, parallel vegetation and belts are more developed. Eroding cyanobacteria, catalysis gastropods and tritons are more abandoned. They all contribute to the erosion of the underlying rock by grazing the vegetational belts and inside sheltered from strong wave action, they enable the development of a reclined U-shaped or V-shaped intertidal nodes. The vertex of the developed tidal notch is located near mean sea level, the base near the lowest tide level and the roof near the highest tide level. Here at Iran, remnants of tidal notches cut into the Mesozoic limestone cliffs can be recognized, indicating four paleo shorelines. Lithophaga holes are well preserved, and they often contain borer cells still articulated and in growth position. This suggests that the uppermost notches were uplifted very rapidly, probably co-seismically, to an elevation enough higher from wave action to protect them from further mid-lateral bioerosion. At the northern limit of the uplifted area in the Corinth Gulf, a subsidence is observed. The earthquakes at 1981 were associated with this coastal subsidence near Alepohori.
Good morning. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. I'm very sorry. I don't know exactly what was the problem. Now we, you will see two Mauro Soldati uh, because uh, we activated, thanks to <laughs> Paola Corazza, we activated uh, uh, two positions, uh, one in a meeting room and one in my office. So in case one clashes, <laughs> we will have the other one working. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure because I was using during this International Geomorphology Week WebEx before and I had no problems. Uh, so, uh, but the problems were also in for my colleagues around. Uh, and so, oh, anyway, now everything seems to be solved. So, Nikki, how, how should we proceed? Okay, good morning, everybody. Let me share for a few minutes uh, my uh, screen. No, 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 it's not okay. Thank you. Okay, maybe some of you um, joined uh, us uh, during uh, this uh, week, uh, the week of uh, geomorphology. In any case, it's a, a great pleasure to welcome you all to this short-term uh, virtual mobility course entitled Webinars on uh, Geomorphology and Quaternary uh, Geology. Um, as you may know, no, this uh, short course uh, was organized in the framework of uh, CVs. Um, CVs aims to create uh, a truly unique European inter-university campus where students, academics, researchers and staff will move and collaborate as freely as within their institution of uh, origin. It has started with uh, eight, uh, seven, now eight uh, universities, but uh, other universities outside the uh, uh, CVs uh, may uh, join, as has happened uh, in uh, this uh, uh, week. Uh, we, we have uh, already, during this week, three, three, these three uh, webinars. Uh, for those that have not uh, managed to follow us, um, I will just uh, to mention that uh, we have uh, recorded everything and um, Soon it will be uploaded at the CVC web site, so you may uh, follow them uh, asynchronously. Um, the same will happen uh, for uh, this, the fourth uh, one uh, webinar. It will be also recorded and uh, uploaded to the CVC web page. Some uh, general uh, uh, guidelines is uh, to use uh, uh, the chat to pose any questions. These questions will be collected and answered at the end of the webinar. Uh, please keep uh, your, your microphone and your camera off during uh, the webinar. And uh, we will, as I mentioned before, we will uh, record it. However, no pers personal information will be visible uh, when uh, we will uh, distribute uh, uh, the uh, video. And um, Maybe some of you would like uh, to have a certification of uh, your attendance. Uh, in uh, this uh, case, uh, we will uh, post uh, at uh, the chat uh, a link where you can uh, request um, uh, a certification and we will uh, come back uh, to you. And uh, also we will post a questionnaire um, also in the chat that uh, we would uh, be delighted if uh, you uh, answer it. Um, at uh, this point, I would like uh, to, to thank uh, 
Professor Mauro Soldati, uh, who is uh, uh, the president of uh, International Association of uh, Geomorphologists, who uh, is uh, with us uh, uh, today to give uh, a lecture in this uh, webinar, and also his uh, colleague, uh, Professor uh, Paolo, uh, Paola Coranja, uh, for uh, joining us and uh, giving also uh, a part of uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, last but not uh, the least, uh, don't miss uh, uh, another uh, CVS uh, activity that it is already uploaded at uh, the CVS uh, uh, website. It's um, about uh, virtual field trips and uh, we, th we think that uh, it is important in uh, this uh, COVID, COVID pandemic uh, uh, period. And uh, thanks uh, to... Uh, to different universities participating uh, in this uh, event, uh, we will be able to provide different geomorphological environments uh, connected with the uh, different prevailing uh, processes and quaternary history that uh, have shaped uh, the landscape. And uh, now I would uh, kindly ask um, uh, Professor uh, Mauro uh, Soldati and uh, 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 Professor uh, Paula Coraggia to um, go on with uh, with uh, this uh, webinar, uh, which is um, about um, uh, long-term coastal landslide evolution and sea level change. Uh, um, Paolo, um, Mauro, please, and thank you again for. Uh, for this honor to, to be with us today. Uh, thank you, Professor Evelpidu. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure uh, to be one of the lecturers of uh, this very important course. And um, I am also glad that you were kindly involving Unimore that is not part officially of the CVS network uh, to join uh, this uh, teaching and training activity. So today, um, my colleague Paola Corazza and I will talk uh, about uh, long-term coastal evolution uh, in, the in a Mediterranean area. We will deal uh, especially with uh, a case study that we have been uh, dealing with for quite a number of years. And so we got quite experienced in different techniques for the study of coastal environments, both terrestrial and uh, uh, submarine ones. Um, so uh, we will start with a general introduction uh, and then uh, we will uh, go on uh, with uh, uh, the illustration of the specific case of Malta. Um, I just ask if you can uh, tell me if you can clearly see uh, the screen. Yes, yes, okay. very well. Okay, great, great, thank you. Um, so, uh, how have we organized this uh, uh, lecture lesson? Um, in seven points, uh, seven is a good number. <laughs> they uh it's the perfect number so our lecture will not be perfect but uh, we try to <laughs> subdivide it into seven points like seven good reasons we have um let's say outlined to integrate terrestrial and marine uh, data sets um so we will start uh, with this trying to outline to you how and why we should integrate terrestrial and marine data set for a comprehensive study and understanding of coastal morphodynamics and for a correct um, management of those areas. Then uh, we will focus on coastal landslide as a geohazard. Um, and then we will look more directly to our specific case study. And we will talk about recognition, mapping, and monitoring of coastal landslides, um, starting from terrestrial ones, and then getting to uh, submerged landslides. Uh, we will see that in most cases, uh, the one we see 
above the sea level continue below the sea level. Actually, they are the same landslide, which at the moment are partially hidden by the sea. Because as, you, as many of you may already know, uh, during uh, the last uh, uh, 20,000 years, uh, since the last glacial cycle, the, the Mediterranean environment, and not only, changed dramatically. And uh, the, the sea level increased by around uh, 130 meters since the last glacial. Uh, so, uh, we will try to show you how we integrated the data set of terrestrial and marine landforms that we collected through time. And then uh, we will try to show you how we tried to give a chronological constraint to the coastal land for uh, landslide evolution, actually in relation to sea level change and particularly uh, to those two moments, uh, very different moments in terms of paleogeography of the Mediterranean, the last glacial maximum on the one end and uh, the present situation with, of course, a series of steps in between. Um, and the last part uh, is uh, related to the importance, to the role of geomorphological mapping in um, representing terrestrial and submarine landforms and processes. And we will show, uh, we will try to show you how it is important to integrate in single comprehensive documents, actually maps, um, uh, the areas which were subject to uh, retreat and uh, rise of sea level during the last thousands of years. Um, so let's start from the first of the seven points, which is entitled Seven Good Reasons to Integrate Terrestrial and Marine Datasets. Uh, we have recently published uh, a paper on this on the journal Water. Uh, so uh, some of the schemes you are going to see here are actually part of this uh, recent paper. Uh, through the presentation, you will find uh, some references to literature because uh, we thought that, especially for those of you who are more advanced in their studies, uh, I refer especially to master and PhD students, uh, um, having hand, uh, handy uh, references to papers uh, might be useful or of interest. So, um, we have to say that uh, during the last few years, uh, there was an important increase in the development of techniques and tools uh, for the study of coastal environments. What we can do now, not we as a research group, but we in general as scientific community working in uh, geomorphology and quaternary geology, uh, what we can do now, it's completely different from what we could do, uh, I would not say 20 years ago, but even only 10 years ago. Um, so now uh, we can really provide a homogeneous and continuous representation of the earth surface from the land, of course, from onshore down to the deep sea floor. Uh, there is uh, an area which is called the white ribbon. I don't know if you have uh, ever heard this term. The white ribbon is the area just between uh, the coastline, the emerge, the first emerge area, and uh, the deeper sea floor. Because in this area, um, till a few years ago, it was difficult to get. Um, um, good uh, representation of the sea floors in terms of digital terrain models because the techniques and instruments that were used for the deep sea floor were not appropriate there and uh, those that were used onshore were also not appropriate in this white ribbon what we also call the near shore area so in this scheme, which is also published in the paper I mentioned before, you can clearly see a subdivision in offshore area, near shore area and onshore area 
with respect to the type of instruments and tools that we can use uh, to, to, uh, to provide the, the homogeneous representation of uh, the land surface, both outside the sea and below, below the sea. Uh, from a more geog physical geographical uh, perspective, uh, we can talk about continental slope, continental shelf, uh, shore face or near shore area, if you wish. Uh, and then when we get close to the coastline and then uh, the coastal plain, including possible beaches and, uh, and so on. So we, we can use uh, different instrumentation now that can, uh, that can give very useful uh, results uh, uh, for further geomorphological uh, studies and geomorphological interpretation also of long-term past processes. Uh, so um, technological solutions for collecting data um, data sets, uh, both terrestrial and marine ones, um, I are now high resolution ones. So we range from satellite imagery, airborne light detecting and ranging, um, which you know as LIDAR, that can have a useful application also below the sea level and crude or unmanned aerial vehicles, the drones, uh, that can be used both onshore and uh, also offshore, uh, remotely operating vehicles which uh, can mount echo sounders uh, to obtain high resolution imagery and uh, derive data sets. So uh, you understand that nowadays uh, we can get such a representation of the seafloor uh, that can uh, somehow enable us uh, to get to similar conclusions, conclusions similar to those that we can achieve uh, for terrestrial areas. Then, of course, you have to integrate all this because um, there was and partially there is still a tendency of either studying terrestrial areas geomorphologists, quaternary geologists, uh, engineers, um, and uh, those who study um, submarine areas. They can still be uh, geomorphologists, submarine geomorphologists, uh, or uh, marine geologists, or biologists. But in many cases, uh, you will see also in literature that those who study terrestrial areas do not study submerged areas and vice versa. Um, so we, we tried in our paper to collect information about what has been done instead to integrate uh, uh, these data set, terrestrial and marine ones. And we also tried to apply um, the let's say the potential of instrumentation and tools uh, to the specific case study of the Maltese islands. But before going to that, I would like to show you the, the seven good reasons to integrate uh, uh, terrestrial and marine data sets. What are these uh, uh, reasons? Uh, so uh, this graph uh, uh, this chart shows you what we um, collected in terms of information from li a literature review. So uh, it shows the fields of application of the integration of terrestrial and marine data sets. In practice, it means how many papers, how many articles have been published referring to each of the seven reasons. You will see, and this is, will be part of the talk, uh, of the today's talk, the, the lead is taken by Joe Hazards. So most of the papers dealing with coastal areas and integrating terrestrial and marine data sets uh, deal with Joe Hazard, almost 35% of them, which with respect to the other is quite a relevant one. But of course, there are also practical reasons uh, 
you know, the, the, the many coastal areas are quite vulnerable. So it is really important in terms of risk assessment to properly to properly evaluate geohazard there. Um, then other other aspects in which this integration is uh, carried out are coastal planning and management, uh, fifteen percent. Marine and landscape ecology, with uh, an important contribution by biologists. Um, geomorphological mapping. Uh, so far, it's just 8.5, actually. Um, but this is a sector that is um, steadily, uh, that has been steadily increasing in the last few years. So I think, I believe that in the next years, the percentage of uh, uh, studies that will deal with integrated geomorphological mapping will increase in coastal areas. Uh, then uh, uh, late uh, quaternary change and coastal landscape studies, uh, almost 10%. In, um, in the Mediterranean areas especially, um, an important focus is given to geoarchaeology. Uh, there are a number of, of archaeological remnants that are below the sea level uh, today, nowadays. And the contribution of uh, geology, quaternary geology and geomorphology is surely important in trying to understand why today they are submerged, uh, how we can uh, um, infer when and how they were submerged. Sometimes it's not just a matter of a sea level rise, but it's also a matter of tectonics. Uh, and then another important aspect that is also increasing, uh, in the, that has been increasing in the last years, is the attention to geoheritage and geodiversity, trying to, um, to link information, geomorphological information and data sets of submerged and terrestrial area, um, trying to give a holistic view of geoheritage both above and below the sea level. Getting more in detail, um, first, geomorphological mapping. Uh, geomorphological mapping, and this is also one of the reasons that will be dealt with uh, in the second part of this lesson, uh, refers essentially to the development uh, of maps that take into account coastal morphodynamics, thanks to the innovative uh, techniques that we looked at before, and also to um, other techniques of uh, really uh, of representation techniques that can uh, lead to uh, maps uh, that could be readable and understandable also by non-specialists. Uh, lands coastal landscape evolution. Um, many areas of the world experienced uh, in recent geological times uh, decrease and increase of the sea level uh, referring to climate, global climate changes. So a deeper understanding of late quaternary changes of coastal landscape and environments, uh, uh, which is also useful uh, for prediction of uh, future risk scenarios, is part of this, uh, can benefit from this integration of data sets. Uh, I mentioned to you already geoarchaeology, geoarchaeology um, with important perspectives in terms of research development in coastal and near shore environments. And uh, as I mentioned before, also geoheritage and geodiversity are now playing a role in this integration of terrestrial and marine data sets. I will not now spend more words on geohazards because we will talk about that uh, quite widely afterwards. Uh, marine and landscape uh, ecology, I mentioned uh, the, the contribution of different expertise in this type of studies. Uh, so uh, geomorphology and quaternary geology can give a critical, very important support to other disciplines involved in generating key data for the sustainable, sustainable management of marine resources. So also mapping, geomorphological mapping, would be important for 
preserving marine resources. Uh, coastal planning and management, which is strictly linked with the geohazard and georisk aspect, consists in the establishment of a more sustainable development of objectives in planning and management of coastal areas, also in the framework of the so-called integrated coastal zone uh, management. And this, through the integration of terrestrial marine data sets, can be dealt with with uh, much more efficacy. Uh, finally, the integration I mentioned already more than once can lead, if properly um, uh, made, can lead to a more effective and sustainable coastal management. Sustainable also in terms of costs, costs for the community, and uh, including risk reduction. As you know, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction um, plays, uh, uh, plays an important role in, uh, in the management of, uh, of risk in different environments and the coastal risk is also included. So, coastal landslide as a geohazard. Um, you may know the difference between hazard and risk when we want to talk using a, a, a correct technical and scientific language. So we, when we talk about hazard, we mean the probability that a certain event occurs in a certain area with a certain intensity. When we talk about risk, we consider also another aspect, the vulnerability of a certain area. So the combination between hazard and vulnerability brings to risk. And so we can correctly assess risk in coastal areas and of course in other areas only if we combine hazard and vulnerability that have to be studied uh, in detail and uh, uh, taking advantage nowadays of new tools and techniques. When you deal with coastal landslides, uh, if you have dealt uh, with coastal landslides, if you had to deal uh, with uh, people uh, managing coastal areas or institution managing coastal areas, you may have uh, heard more um, uh, worries about coastal erosion also in relation to sea level rise and not so much about landsliding. Uh, actually the two aspects of erosion and landsliding, uh, given the increased frequency and intensity of extreme events which are related to the, the climate change uh, uh, we are observing uh, in the, we have been observing in the last years uh, and um, so the, the increase the frequency and intensity of these events uh, linked also to the sea level rise which is of course a much longer term process may lead to increased hazard and risk. Uh, lately in, la in the last years, in the last tens of years, the vulnerability of coastal areas has also increased that you do, due to the increase of uh, the, the enlargement of uh, recreational areas, urbanized areas, and, uh, and so on. So, uh, since the, uh, this event is organized by the Greek colleagues, uh, I, I try to steal a very significant case from uh, the Greek uh, the Greek country uh, and particularly from a Greek island, the island of Zakynthos, uh, Zante, uh, where uh, there was a rockfall. A rockfall occurred in uh, September 2018, giving rise uh, to a number of injuries. Um, the, you can just Google this event and you will find lots of information. This occurred in a, in a, on a beach that I also visited as a tourist some years ago and I can tell you that it's really a fantastic place 
and for this reason it is attended by many tourists which makes them vulnerable because you have these cliffs which may be unstable and when you have to deal with rock falls many times it is not so easy to predict when a rock fall is going to occur uh, just to give you an idea for those uh, who are not uh, familiar migliaia di bambini stanno morendo in questo momento oh my god for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, coastal rock falls you can see the sorry mauro Yes. We cannot see, we can hear your video, but we cannot see what you are showing us. No, you are not seeing this. Uh, we see this, but the video, no. Ah. We, we hear the, no, the, the voice of the video, but we cannot see the movie. Ah, that's strange. Probably this is related to, to something to that some web, uh, WebEx uh, filters or something like this. So maybe. maybe the video is playing uh, to a second monitor. I'm not sure. Uh, no, 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 it's, no, no. Anyway, there is the link here. And if you can just Google it, you will see the images and the tourists uh, that since this was September, a period of uh, high uh, level tourism in these areas, uh, tourists uh, uh, running away so there were tourists actually lying just below the cliff and this happens many times in uh, in coastal areas where you have cliffs uh, sometimes uh, you have warnings sometimes you have not and so this is a situation that may bring uh, to important geohazards um, uh, I now shift to Italy. This is uh, one of the islands just outside of the Latium uh, uh, coastline in, um, in Italy. And um, there was a rockfall uh, that occurred in the same year, on 20 July, uh, that uh, uh, was really frightening for the people who were around and also for those uh, who were sailing around, because when you have uh, lands like, like those, you can have also uh, tsunamis, uh, maybe of not great intensity, but if you are there with a small boat, they can surely affect you. Uh, I will try this uh, video and then Nikki tell me if it works or not. Maybe that, that one was on the BBC, so maybe uh, there was some filter. Tell me if you can see something here. Can you see the video? No, just a black screen. <laughs> okay, so I think that this is a WebEx. Um... Um, there is a comment from uh, in the chat, and I think it is the case that uh, you are sharing uh, the presentation window and not your screen and the video is playing in your in your screen and not in the uh, presentation window okay that, that that could be a possibility yes 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 uh, so but anyway you you have uh, the links here you just can google them and i have brought i have put some images anyway here so so if you are interested in this topic please have a look of the videos because uh, they are really really significant um and can give you an idea of situations where even a small landslide uh, can kill people. Look at the landslide, the rockfall that occurred in uh, Ventotene, which is in Aponza, is the island I showed you just before. Here we have Naples and Rome is above here. So this is in Ventotene. This was outside uh, the, 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 the main peak uh, tourist season. There was just uh, a, a class uh, uh, on a school trip there. It was April, and this small 
landslide killed two girls who were on that field trip. This uh, is, I think this is a cl quite clear example on how even small uh, landslide events uh, can determine injuries or even deaths in coastal areas. So this makes us understand that it is very important to deal uh, with both uh, coastal hazard and uh, coastal vulnerability with uh, a very uh, attentive approach, um, especially in, uh, in tourist areas. A landslide play an important role and you have always to link geomorphological processes and understanding how erosion could play a role in uh, triggering landslides, in favoring their activity and eventually in triggering landslides. Just uh, a few days ago, uh, something very striking happened in, uh, uh, in Liguria. Liguria is northern it is in northern Italy, uh, a beautiful coast, beautiful villages, but a very fragile areas. And uh, extreme events uh, which occurred uh, recently have uh, created geo-risk situations all around due to coastal erosion, due to debris flows and mud flows. And this was very striking. It was on all the media. Uh, what is probably a, a small scale landslide actually uh, hit a cemetery and uh, practically destroyed a part of the cemetery that fell down into the sea. Um, and uh, you may imagine what happened with coffins into the water and so on. There was a plan to mitigate <clears throat> the risk there and some works uh, uh, were undertaken but uh, they were not completed and so the, the cemetery was not in in uh, in safe conditions this is another significant case of coastal uh, vulnerability <clears throat> in uh, times when we are really suffering of uh, from uh, extreme events uh, storm uh, storm waves, uh, intense rainfall, and so on. Uh, you can look at the video on Google. You can just Google uh, Camogli, uh, Camogli, Frana, Frana in Italian means uh, landslide. If you just Google Frana Camogli, which is the locality that you can see here on the left, you can find the video. Um, I mentioned to you that we will be talking about Malta. So, uh, risk issues in Malta, of course, of course there are because uh, um, Malta is uh, an archipelago made up of three islands, and you have uh, different type of coasts there, as we will see, uh, that may be affected by different type of uh, coastal hazards. Landslides is one of this. Uh, 12 years old boy was killed in 1970. And uh, from time to time on uh, local newspapers and media, you can uh, uh, see reporting uh, injuries that occur to tourists that visit these areas. Um, these phenomena occurred, occur quite frequently. Sometimes they are larger, sometimes they are smaller. But please consider that in such situations, even small events can be lethal. Uh, so the storms can be one of the causes, the infiltration of water uh, due to rainfall can be another cause, and uh, uh, marine coastal erosion in general also uh, linked to sea level rise can be another cause. Um, these rock falls do not occur just at uh, the contact uh, uh, between terrestrial and marine areas, but also on higher areas, and then uh, the, the material can roll down and eventually reach beaches at uh, at the bottom of the slopes or at the bottom of the cliffs. So attention should be posed also to areas which are not so close to the beach, but anyhow above the beach. Uh, Malta 
actually Gozo, the island of Gozo, which is the northern island of uh, the Maltese archipelago, was affected by, uh, by an event uh, that was really striking for the Maltese island because uh, in a few minutes, uh, the, the icon of the Maltese landscape, the so-called Azure window, collapsed. It collapsed on the occasion of a storm, a very intense storm, that hit the northwestern coast of, of Gozo. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in Malta or if you've ever seen any, any tourist material regarding Malta, that this photograph, the one on the, either on the left or on the right above, was there. Uh, if you got to the airport, this was the big image that you can that you could find that, uh, as soon as you landed in Malta. Um, and then eventually this, uh, this uh, landform, this uh, arch, rock arch, collapsed. Attention was given to the stability of the upper part of the arch. And there were a few studies trying to understand whether this would be collapsing. This is an image taken uh, some time before they restricted the access to this part of the arch. Uh, when actually, when it occurred, the, 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 uh, the access was restricted and no one could got, get up there. But anyway, the attention was uh, posed to this part of the arch. And instead, the problem was beneath, because this part, uh, this part uh, uh, of the of uh, the rock mass is made up of a more erodible rock than the member above. This is a, a coralline limestone belonging to the upper coralline limestone formation that widely outcrop in Malta, and this member is more erodible than this one. And the problem was actually below the sea level because uh, this part of the block was diminishing its, its width uh, going down below the sea. So eventually during this storm, uh, this arch was somehow cut at the base and it collapsed. Uh, the fact that, the, that this material was more erodible is uh, uh, witnessed also by the fact that the block that is uh, indicated by the arrow here in the left image uh, collapsed in 2012. So the, this was already an, uh, giving an idea that this part of uh, the pillar of the rock arch was somehow uh, restricting in, in size. Uh, but then uh, not much attention was uh, given to what was happening below the sea. So this is again maybe an extreme case, but that gives you an idea that it is always important to understand not only which is the rock control, different type of rocks and their erodibility, but also what happens above and below the sea level. We, uh, we wrote a paper about uh, this in collaboration with uh, Maltese colleagues of the University of Malta, because this is really an important area uh, with important cultural values uh, uh, for, for the Maltese. Um, and so we try to map this area, showing how, trying to show how geomorphological mapping is always important when you deal with uh, uh, coastal <coughs> studies. Um, this area is in particularly uh, characterized by sinkholes, partly emerged and partly submerged sinkholes. So uh, I think I, I, I showed you enough uh, that on coastal areas we may have different type of hazards and in particular my attention was given to landslides, but coastal areas surely are vulnerable many times, not always, but many times due to the presence of uh, um, visitors, tourists uh, that sometimes access areas which are not even uh, um, inhabited, 
Um, I think also about remote beaches and, uh, and so on, or remote cliffs, but also areas where you have, uh, uh, for example, hotels, uh, recreational areas like this one that I will talk to you uh, later on, which is an amusement park located exactly uh, inside uh, uh, an active slide, uh, landslide. Uh, how to recognize, map, and monitor coastal landslide. So I will try to show how we recognized, mapped, and monitored the coastal landslide uh, in different parts of, parts of Malta, focusing anyway on the northwest coast of Malta. Um, the whole island can be considered as an open-air laboratory for the study of coastal landslide on the Mediterranean for a number of reasons, uh, because uh, the geology in this respect, not from a stratigraphical or purely geological sense, is quite, uh, is quite simple. You have uh, almost all over a an horizontal layering of rocks and geological formations. You have a very scarce vegetation. So, of course, this favor uh, geomorphological, uh, favor the access to these areas and uh, geomorphological uh, investigation. Uh, so, the first step uh, for us was to uh, have an idea of uh, how coastal geomorphotypes were distributed all along the uh, Maltese coastline. Uh, we also mapped areas where we found boulders on the coast, either due to storm, uh, storm wave deposits, or also uh, in, in other papers, our colleagues, uh, tsunami, tsunami uh, deposits. So we will be dealing essentially with the area that I'm now indicating, the northwest coast of Malta. Uh, if you look at this map, you can clearly see something. Uh, a blue line here, central south of Malta. I'm referring, of course, to the west part of Malta now. And then here, essentially, a, a, red, a, a red line. So where we see the blue, it's actually plunging cliffs. So almost vertical or vertical cliffs. Above here, instead, due to structural situations and a big fault, it's called the Great Fault, we have another world from a geological viewpoint in terms of landslide occurrence. So here you would expect mainly rock falls and here you would expect another type of landslides, essentially rock spreading followed by <clears throat> block sliding. Of course, you can locally have also um, rock falls and uh, topples. Um, the the coastal geomorphotypes in Malta are very diverse, and uh, in a paper published on the Journal of Maps. Uh, we tried uh, to, uh, to illustrate with images the different morphotypes. The area on which we will uh, focus our attention today is the one reported here with D. So, an area where you have scree deposits uh, um, reaching sometimes the coast and sometimes not. I will let you know why we have this uh, geological and geomorphological situation in the north part of the island. Um, I will try to do this showing at the same time what we did in terms of landslide research uh, on the northwest coast of Malta. Now I will start with the, the studies that we uh, carried out on terrestrial landslides, or better, on the part of the land landslide which is emerged at the moment. Uh, we dealt uh, with uh, such problems and issues uh, in the frame of a series of uh, projects funded by the Council of Europe and carried out uh, in collaboration with Maltese uh, colleagues. This is uh, just to give you an idea on, on 
the physiography of the northern part of Malta, this is the situation. So when we meant scree deposits, we meant a situation uh, where you have a plateau with its very clearly defined cliff. Uh, this is the edge of the scarp of the plateau. Uh, a plateau made up of upper coralline limestones. Below you have blue clays, which are actually uh, marls and clays, but with a different, a very different geomechanical behavior. So above you have this plateau, which is also jointed, fractured due to the tectonics that have affected through time the islands. And, um, and below we have these, so these cracks, of course, can bring water down to the Mars and clays, which may assume a visco viscoplastic behavior, bringing to uh, block slides, uh, to movement of blocks uh, till the coasts, uh, movement of the blocks over the clays that tend to flow and slide. So we have actually in the middle and lower part of the slopes also earth flows and earth slides. Um, we will concentrate our attention on the, this uh, promontory, which is very, very interesting from uh, um, the geomorphological viewpoint and the fantastic case uh, for the study of uh, rock spreading, as you may guess, uh, looking at this image. Looking at this image, if you think about the relationship between erosion and landslide, please consider also the fact that when you have these blocks moving down, here we have clays, of course, and you see the clays also here. When we have these blocks moving down to the coast, we have somehow an armoring, a natural protection of the coast. So there is always this interplay between landsliding and uh, erosion. In a situation like this, where there is not this armoring uh, by the rock limestone blocks, you see that the erosion is playing a major role. Um, in the southern part of the island, uh, where we have uh, the clays above uh, due to tectonic reasons, uh, uh, in the southern part of the island, we have the outcrop of uh, geological formations like the lower coralline, coralline limestone, which do not outcrop in the upper part of the island. So from uh, the north and south part of the archipelago, there is this great fault that divides these two geological environments, let's say in brackets. So now we concentrate on the northern part, just above uh, the Great Fault, which is actually here. Uh, I reported these numbers about the population of Malta um, just to let you know that uh, there is the highest density in Europe. Plus, not at the moment during the pandemic, of course, but generally uh, the visitors, the number of visitors throughout the years, the year, it's really important. Till a few years ago, uh, that occurred uh, especially in, uh, in some seasons, especially during summer. Uh, but uh, now, nowadays, before actually before the pandemic, uh, the, the, the island have been visited by tourists throughout the year, also due to its quite mild uh, climate. Uh, the physiography of the coast is like this. You can already see from this DTM evidence of on, on landslide of landslides. You do not see anything below the sea, but please think about this because we will see how, if and how this landslide continue prolong below the sea level. But at the beginning of our studies, we were not thinking about submarine landslide. Only at a certain stage we understood that these landslides were significantly prolonging below the sea level. And we understood that it was really important to study not only terrestrial area, but also submerged areas, uh, not only for scientific purposes, but also for practical purposes, also for the 
um, evaluation and mitigations of landslide risks. Um, so we started from uh, geomorphological mapping. Uh, we finally, I will show you also about something that refers to the chronology of these landslides. And uh, after monitoring and uh, interferometric analysis, uh, we understood which were the most significant places to have uh, um, monitoring, specific monitoring devices with which we equipped two areas. One is the promontory that we showed, <clears throat> that I showed to you before, and the other one is the amusement park I, I mentioned before. So we started a measurement that is going on, has been going on since 2005-2006. This is uh, quite significant in terms of number of years, uh, because generally when you deal with a certain area, either you deal it because there was a problem and then when the problem is solved, you stop collecting data, or you may have a project, a funded project, which lasts two, three years, and then you devote your attention to the monitoring of that place for during the project, and then you may leave it. Uh, instead, we try to continue the monitoring for a long time, because uh, uh, this could give us very important information, uh, not only on the places that we are studying, but also on other sites in the Mediterranean. <clears throat> we dealt also with the photogrammetric analysis. Geophysics was really important to understand um, geometrical uh, parameters. So we used the ground penetrating radar, we used geoelectric to understand the thickness of um, the plateau in certain sites and understand how could have been the behavior of the clays, the blue clays beneath. Um, permanent scatter interferometry combined with the weight of evidence method brought us also to landslide susceptibility mapping in these coastal um, areas. Then we combine PSI with PST, PS time, uh, for the definement of uh, the definition of the displacement trends. Uh, you will find the references later on in the presentation if you are interested in, in uh, reading more about uh, such topics. So now you can see quite a significant image where you understand uh, uh, very clearly uh, where the plateau is occurring and where the, <coughs> the clays beneath are outcropping. I think that this is very clear uh, even for those who do not know Malta and also for the known specialist of our, of our disciplines. So the promontory I mentioned to you before shows really spectacular uh, spreads of uh, rock blocks. Uh, so when you have cracks that opens up, you are still in the phase of rock spreading, but when the blocks significantly tilt or move from the plateau, then we talk about block slides. Block slides occur over the clays, and it is favored, of course, by the plastic, viscoplastic behavior that the clays may assume when water is present. In the northwest coast, we generally have the upper coralline limestone above, the blue clays below, but sometimes due to uh, the, the, the faults that occur here and there in northern Malta, you can find also the Globigerina limestone and uh, very locally also the lower coralline limestone. So this is one of the stretches of coast where you can see all the uh, stratigraphy of the island. But if you go south of uh, the Great Fault, you will see lower coralline limestone uh, for heights uh, of more than 100 meters, so very spectacular cliffs. Uh, like the so-called Dingley Cliffs. 
more generally uh, in the north part of the island you find the situation where you have the clays at the contact with the sea so you can understand the role played by erosion not only in, okay, on the occasion of uh, extreme events but generally speaking the role of erosion on the blue clays of course as i mentioned before where blocks reach some time ago the coast they can provide harboring protection to uh, erosion uh, so we mapped these landforms with special attention to landslide we recognize the different type of landslides and their state of activity we identified the role of rock spreading and block sliding in the coastal evolution and we got to a geomorphological map at a scale 1 to 7500 for the whole northwest coast. I will not go into details about how we made this map um, and which criteria we used because my colleague Paola Corazza will tell you more later on showing the role of geomorphological mapping in studying of coastal areas. Um, our attention was given not only to landslides themselves, and you can see in these images some spectacular cases, but also on the type of landslides. Please consider, if you have never dealt with uh, landslides, that it is always important if you want to assess uh, hazard landslide hazard or landslide risk that it is very important to define what landslide we are talking about or what type of landslide we are expecting in a certain area because landslide can be characterized different type of landslide can be characterized by different velocities different volumes involved and different kinematics which can play a role in uh, in defining and determining the hazard and risk. So you see that in this part of the coast, 63% of the landslide, uh, with respect to the area which is affected by landslides, is um, referring to block slides. Then we have also a significant percentage of rock fall and then earth flow and earth slides. Um, I would like to stress this point uh, because this is uh, the role of geomorphologists. If you, uh, if you work in an, in an interdisciplinary team, in a multidisciplinary team, it is our role as geomorphologists to show the importance of understanding, recognizing and understanding the type of movement and the type of material involved if you want to correctly define hazard and risk. Um, so this is, uh, I've shown you the promontory from above. This is uh, the promontory seen from the north to the south. So this is the north face of, uh, of the promontory. And there you can clearly see uh, upper coralline limestone above, uh, the blue clays, uh, below and the big blocks in the frontal part of uh, of the of the plateau so i think that by now it is quite clear to you which is the mechanism which is the kinematics of landslides where you have this over positions of a fragile rock like uh, uh, the upper coralline limestone which is a consistent rock but is fragile and can be uh, fractured, jointed, and uh, below uh, the marls and clays, which may assume a viscoplastic behavior if they become somehow wet. <clears throat> Through a recent paper published on remote sensing, we uh, try to show the advantage of using one of the techniques that I mentioned before, and in particular, I'm referring to uncrewed aerial vehicle digital photogrammetry, so the use of drones to identify uh, features, single features, in this case blocks, mega blocks, and smaller blocks, 
that are uh, localized at the bottom of the slopes. It is clear that through this, uh, even though these are slow-moving coastal landslides, if we repeat through time these uh, image acquisition through the drones, then we can compare different digital terrain models and try to see if there are areas where the movement are more significant than in others. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, at the beginning, and we are continuing to do this, uh, we used also interferometric analysis. Interferometric analysis which showed us that there were areas where the deformation was more significant than others. Uh, the two areas we are finally dealing with are this one, this is uh, Il Haraba Plateau, the promontory I mentioned to you before, and this one where you do not see any specific dot which shows the formation because actually here there are no evident permanent scatterers or at least scatterers which are oriented in a favorable, favorable way with respect to the images taken by the satellites. So finally we decided to study this area and this area for different reasons. And here you can see clearly that above the plateau you have uh, uh, green points, uh, green dots, uh, that mean uh, no practically no movement, state stability, and instead, below the edge of the scarp, you can see evidence of movement. Um, we also published a couple of papers dealing with these topics. So they, these may be of interest for those of you who are maybe carrying out a PhD uh, thesis or master thesis on these topics. As regards monitoring, I mentioned to you that we installed, uh, equipped uh, these areas with uh, uh, GPS, uh, GPS uh, benchmarks. So we located a number of them over this plateau. And uh, later on, when we saw that the movement was quite significant, we installed also tape extensometers. I have to tell you that when we started studying these areas, we were not sure at all that these movements were active. Because by eye, it is really difficult to say whether these landslides are moving or not, whether these cracks are opening or not. You just have to monitor them to understand this. And quite strangely to us, um, there were no studies carried out before by even by the, the British scientists who made a lot of geological studies in the area. So there were no studies about uh, the possible uh, displacement of these, uh, of the possible activity of these landslides. Uh, so we started, we started uh, with great enthusiasm in studying these landslides, uh, trying to see at first if the formation was occurring or not. And actually, since the beginning, or actually after the, the, the first year, let's say, we started understanding that these blocks were moving, that these plateaus at their edges are alive. Um, you may think about uh, the, the implications in terms of hazard and risk, because you may think that I told you that these movements are so slow that we couldn't even see by eye whether they were active or not. Uh, I'm referring to uh, lateral spreading and block sliding. So you may think, why is this relevant to hazard and risk assessment? Because this is important, I can tell you, because if you have a plateau, the edge of a plateau or a promontory like this, which is moving because the uh, the clays and marls beneath it are uh, deforming because they are enlarging or shrinking according to their humidity. 
uh, then, uh, of course, you have a series, you may, uh, besides the slow movements, you may have rock falls and topples uh, that can be more frequent at the edges of the plateaus. For example, if we consider this plateau, there is a footpath going all along it. You see part of it. And there are no warnings here about possible rock fall. And I can tell you by experience that if this was not active in terms of rock spreading, the probability of rock falling and, and uh, mm, toppling, rock toppling, would be less. But since we have deformation ongoing, proved by a number of techniques, then you have to pay attention to a possibly increase the frequency of rock falls and rock topples. If uh, while I was talking some of you looked at the GPS measurement, they would have thought that the displacements, both the horizontal ones and the vertical ones, are very small. Only here we, we, we had something like 7 centimeters in uh, 14 years so half a centimeter by year, per year. But you have to consider something else, that we uh, found uh, somehow a seasonality in the deformation of the rock blocks. So actually, besides the fact that they move forward, you have to consider whether they move, whether they tilt or not. And we realize that according to the shrinking or the expanding of uh, the, the material beneath the coralline limestone, we had opening of the cracks, tilting of the, of the, uh, of the blocks. Uh, this tilting was a tilting forward and a tilting backward as well. So you have to consider that finally at some places you may have two centimeters of movement, which is practically nothing, but you have to consider that here there was also a back and forth movement. So the block was somehow moving back and forth. And this, if you consider the stability of the cliffs, makes the difference. Because you have certainly, as I mentioned before, an increased hazard due to possible rock falls and rock topples. Uh, so you see here, <clears throat> this is the year before, just, I just shift back and forth, you see, for example, 304 here, uh, you had no movement here, and here 1.2, okay, so they, they move, this plateau, it's, I mean, this is not scientifically correct as a definition, but this plateau is alive, is deforming. More significant numbers, more significant displacements, actually, were recognized at Il Project. Uh, this bay is called Anchor Bay. It's still in the western coast, uh, northwestern coast of Malta. And here you have uh, some buildings, as you may see. This is the so-called Papai Village. It's the largest amusement park in Malta, which is visited by thousands of people throughout the year. And actually, uh, <clears throat> this was the set of the film by Walt Disney, Papai, uh, that was supposed to be removed after, after the film, but it was not, so it stayed there for a few years. Then they thought about having an amusement park there, which is exactly in, in the middle of an active <clears throat> Uh, rock spread, block slide type, landslide. And the movement here are quite significant. Here we are referring to about uh, 13 years, and uh, you see horizontal displacement which reached 17, 15 centimeters. So it's more than one centimeter per year. Again, it's not much. But if you have a swimming pool, which is attended by many kids uh, every day, especially during the warm season, uh, you, you can understand that from these cliffs, uh, the possibility of a block falling down or something like this can surely be increased. And not only we have significant horizontal movement, 
we have also uh, significant vertical movements. Here, I don't know if you can read this, but this is a 103 benchmark that has been lowered by 26 centimeters. So it means that this wide crack here is really functioning, is really functioning, and this block is both moving forward with a certain angle and moving down. So 103 lowered by 26 centimeters and 102 by 15 centimeters. And the scale here is really quite, quite significant. The uh, geological situation is something like this. So this part on the left of the profile is this one. So they, they are like 90 degrees one with respect to the other. And here is the coast, which is, which is here. So you see you have uh, the upper coralline limestone, two members of it, and the blue clays beneath. And uh, actually the, uh, the village, the Pi village, is placed here uh, on the lower part of the blocks and uh, nearby the clays. So a very striking case which shows the importance of uh, multi-technical studies of uh, coastal uh, landslides. Um, I would not. I don't want to bore you with this, but uh, those of you who are interested, maybe can look at it again when uh, the registration is made available. Uh, so we, in practice, realized what was also reported somehow in literature about the pros and cons, the main advantages and main limits of both uh, of all the techniques we used. But uh, the lesson we learned here is that the multi-technical approach is certainly promising and very useful if you want to deal uh, finally with hazard and risk related to coastal landslides. Um, because every, every technique has its advantages and limits and using many of them enables you to get the best from any of those. So uh, we were able to get to a landslide susceptibility map uh, using the outputs of permanent scatter interferometry and the weight of evidence method. Uh, the parameters that we considered along the coast were the slope angle, the curvature, the distance from the coastline, the distance from the scarp, the distance from the faults, so here, I as I told you, there is a quite important role made by, played by, by the faults and joints. And then uh, an index which is called the top topographic position index, probably for those of you who are familiar with this, this is already, already known. So we identified susceptibility classes. Now we are working on defining hazard situation and then we would like to combine the vulnerability still to be assessed to get to a final risk map. Um, but at the same time we understood that besides uh, the, the number of blocks that we could see on the seafloor just outside the coast, we understood that this landslide may be prolonging uh, below the sea level. And so uh, we made multi-beam surveys to get information about the seafloor, get detailed information about the seafloor, um, with the aim then of coupling the terrestrial information that we were getting before uh, with the marine data sets. So uh, this again was carried out in the frame of uh, a Council of Europe funded uh, projects. If some of you is not familiar with the paleogeography of the Mediterranean and uh, with uh, uh, what happened uh, since the last uh, glacial maximum till today, uh, I have uh, included this image. So, uh, with the blue line, uh, it is indicated uh, the coastline uh, in the central Mediterranean during the LGM. The LGM uh, is around uh, 24 to uh, 
let's say, depending on the schemes and the areas of the world, it, it should range between 30,000 to 19,000 years BP. In some areas, the you would see indication of 24 to 18, 19,000. Anyway, we are talking about periods far away from us uh, if we consider human times, but if we consider geological times, it's just not even yesterday, it's just a few hours ago in geological times. And the paleogeography was completely different. Malta would have been Italian, like Sicily would have been part of Italy, no need of a bridge between Calabria and Sicily, which is something debated a lot, which have been debated a lot in Italy during, during the last years. Um, so you see Malta, Malta, especially on is, its eastern side uh, at this, uh, uh, this long bridge co connecting with Sicily with also migration of uh, animals uh, and very significant uh, aspects uh, which goes outside uh, our field. On the, on the north, northwest side, uh, the emerged areas were, were not so significant because then there is uh, the, the, continental, uh, the continental slope and the, the, the continental shelf hands. Um, what was, uh, when we were studying our landslide, when we were looking at the sea without understanding what there was beneath. So before we get the multi-beam data, we were discussing with the colleagues of the CNR of Padua, of the um, CNR of Bologna, about what was beneath the sea level. And we, one of our interpretation, let's say, uh, or better hypothesis was that the landslide that we, this is the promontory, the landslide that we saw uh, on, on shore should, should be prolonging below the sea level. But how much, how much we didn't know un, until we made this multi-beam survey and, and collected a detailed, and detailed um, mapping of uh, the topography. So uh, now, if you see here, it's quite clear the, the situation. This is the coastline during the last glacial maximum, the blue line. Okay, so that's about 130 meters below the sea level. And this is the present coastline. So all this area was emerged during the last glacial maximum, and then the environment was slightly changing with progressive sea level rise. From these images, you see already that you can see deposits, a rugged, rugged seabed uh, till a certain depth, but not till the uh, one minus 130 meters. Actually, if we get more in detail and we get by the ridge, which is this one, this is in more detail, you see that uh, we have clear evidence of landslide deposit till about 40 meters below the sea level. This 40, 45 meters below the sea level is the depth that we find for most of the landslides along the northwest coast. This means that what we see on shore, which are anyway spectacular landslide deposits, um, are just one third of the full landslide deposit. So, uh, and also plateaus like you see here emerge, like the promontory that we saw before, you can find some of them also below, below the sea level. So what is now hidden by the sea is a landscape that was very similar uh, during the last glacial maximum to the landscape that we observe now on shore. Why this? Because, and this was proved by further studies, because the increase of the sea level and the energy of marine activity was not enough to delete the evidence of fluvial landforms, of landslide 
deposits. So uh, it was the landscape uh, that was emerged during the last glacial maximum was somehow sealed by the water without major changes. And so uh, while getting up and up, the sea level was not modifying significantly the landslide deposits. This is what we saw from above. So you see that this is deposit, the deposit that you can clearly see on shore. You can understand that there is also something beneath. This is the emerged landslide deposit. But if you then map in detail the full landslide deposit, you see how far we go till about minus 40 meters below the sea level. This makes you understand also how larger the Caraba Plateau was in the past, should have been in the past, because most of the blocks that you find all around were very likely part of this plateau. This ap applies also to the area where we saw the amusement park, which is actually here within Anchor Bay. So the, uh, the, let's say that the amusement park is on a side of uh, the, uh, the bay. And you see in front of the bay, in front of the promontory, there is a huge landslide deposit. So here even more than two thirds of the landslide deposit are under the sea reaching minus 45 meters, about minus 45 meters. Again, another image and here the present coastline. So you see that this is a very fascinating, um, very fascinating uh, field of research. You can discover very, very interesting geomorphological features. The, the rock spread and block slide over which Papai village is built is this one, but look in front of the promontory, which is the situation. So in blue, you see the present coastline and all the deposits, so the block slide deposits are indicated with this rugged surface colored in brown. So huge landslide deposits. Then we got to a stage when we really needed to merge, sorry, to merge, submerge, to integrate submerged and terrestrial landslide deposits. Uh, so here, for example, you see uh, il, the plateau and here you see just here, no, sorry, here is the plateau, you don't see it, and below it the deposit of the plateau. At Angkor Bay, where the village is located, then you have all these deposits but still these images are not very very refined um, the comparison of uh, that i showed to you before of uh, features above and below the sea level contributed then to uh, the understanding of uh, the geomorphological evolution the longer term geomorphological evolution and were significant for making also an integrated mapping. So one of the first map that we tried to do was this one where we indicated the minus 130 um, isobath. We indicated in blue the present coastline and then with the same color we indicated the landslide deposits. So you see here at by the ridge they are very well uh, developed and also at the promontory, they are very, very well developed below the sea level. Paola Corazza will tell you about the integrated geomorphological mapping uh, later on. Uh, in in, in uh, two, three days, we will finish this presentation. Oh, so I'm just joking. Uh, we, I'm getting close to the end of my part. She will let you know about how we um, set up the legend. You see the emerged port part of Malta is this one. All this is submerged on one side and the other side. Just to give you an idea, the promontory of Il Araba is here and the area of Papai village is here. Uh, if you want to properly address issues regarding 
landslide hazard and risk in coastal areas, it is always important to understand uh, uh, the chronological evolution of landslide, not only their present state of activity. This is also very significant and uh, very interesting uh, um, aspect from the scientific viewpoint, of course. Um, there is uh, no way to date the landslide through the classical uh, methods of dating, the radiometric dating through C14. Uh, it's not possible. Here, you do not have any buried uh, organic matter. So, we thought about uh, uh, cosmogenic ray exposure dating. It's the dating of, for those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, in very simple words, it's the dating of surfaces that have been exposed to cosmic rays after a detachment, after a landslide, something like this. So, you have uh, for example, a crack, there is a detachment or a movement of a block and the surface is left available to the cosmic rays to reach them. So through this method, it is possible to understand when the cosmic, with the margin of error, of course, um, according also to the local situation, you, you can detect, you can date somehow when the cosmic rays could reach that surface. Uh, this was a method that was used especially when you had quartz in the rocks, uh, but lately it developed very well also for limestones, uh, dolomite rocks, so carbonatic rocks. So we could apply the method here in collaboration with a colleague of the University of Exeter, who is now working in Australia, and he already had these uh, contacts with the Canberra National University, and we were able to date uh, their, our samples. So, but finally, what did we date? We tried to date uh, the cliffs, uh, the higher cliffs, thinking that these cliffs uh, were uh, left uh, available to be reached by the cosmic rays in all the time. So our, our idea was that these landslide occur a long time ago, but we were not sure when. And we were not sure whether the landslide occurred when the sea level was at a certain stage or another stage. So we really wanted to understand whether these were terrestrial landslide that went into the sea or whether they occurred when the sea was lower and uh, then the, the, the sea come up, came up, rose up and uh, hid part of the landslide deposits. Uh, so we did the same at the two sites at Angkor Bay and at the Arraba uh, Plateau. So we took samples, some data about uh, the horizontal correction, the altitude, the thickness of the material for those of you who are familiar with this, but now I will not go into detail. If you are interested in these data, uh, there is a paper published on the Journal of Coastal Conservation in which you can find uh, the relevant uh, information. Now I would like just to show you the dates. The dates uh, are really, well, I mean, we found them really uh, nice. We like these dates because uh, our hypothesis was that this landslide occurred in a, terrestri in a full terrestrial environment when the sea was much lower, but we couldn't prove that. But the dates helped us supported, let's say, our hypothesis. See this date, 21.4 years BP. And this is the date when the cliff above Papai village was exposed to cosmic rays. We are right in the middle or close to the end of the last glacial maximum, but we are still in the last glacial maximum. At that time, the sea levels was minus 130. So if we ascribe the whole landslide deposit to movements that occurred starting from the upper part of the cliffs, then it means that these landslides were occurring in a full terrestrial, fully terrestrial environment. Then we have other dates 
that are like 9,000 and 7,000. At this stage, uh, probably they were, these were reactivations, we interpreted them as reactivations, possibly linked with an interplay between the water, the rising sea level, and, and the coast. Uh, at Il Araba, we uh, supposed, uh, sorry, we found a, a date of 15,000 for the upper cliff. 15,000, which means we are outside the last glacial maximum, but with the sea level, which was not reaching minus 40, minus the present minus 40, minus 45. So we were still out of the influence of sea action in possibly determining or favoring the landslide. Whilst when we get to 10,000, maybe, maybe we were somehow uh, close to, to have this interplay. So uh, again, the same scheme, minus, minus 130 here, you see uh, situations in which we try to understand when the sea level was increasing. Now, I don't want to bore you on this, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, uh, the first time failure, at least the first time failure that we were able to date, uh, brought to landslide that did not reach the sea at the time when they occurred. Probably these uh, were conditions where were more humid conditions, more, 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 more humid than today, which probably favored those significant movements, large and deep-seated movements. We also got to two hypotheses then regarding the evolution of, of the cliff. Uh, one is a progressive retreat of the cliff, but considering also the dates that we got, is that eventually there was a first time failure in more humid conditions than today, and then successive movements uh, that uh, put in the condition, uh, that put some rock faces, faces of rock blocks in the conditions of reaching the uh, cosmic rays. So we are still debating among our research group, which could be the uh, the model that uh, is uh, uh, that would best fit to the local situation, and now we are working on this uh, together with the colleagues uh, from uh, uh, the Kingston University, from with the colleagues from Kingston University, uh, who pre uh, before us wrote a paper on uh, on uh, the Maltese mudslides, but he, at that time he did not consider rock spread and rock slides and block slides and now we got to him and try to model these processes with him so we hope that we will be able to publish soon a paper on modeling of these processes well uh, we have not finished here uh, our research because we would like to integrate more and more uh, uh, surface and uh, submarine data um, and we would like to understand, because now we have understood that the portion of the landslide which is emerged is active through different methods, interferometry, um, through um, uh, extensometers, uh, fissurimeters, uh, uh, whatever, interferometry, we understood that these are active movements, but what happens below the sea level? Are these block movements or the sealing of the seas preventing any movement? This is important because below the sea level you have a series of manufacts, you have tubes, uh, conducts that can be uh, affected by possible movement of, uh, in terms of landslide of the sea floor. Uh, then another step would be also producing risk maps that would take into account uh, sea level change because this is a long-term process which is not generally accounted for in hazard and risk maps related to specific areas so we would like to to deal also with this 
and trying to define based on the experience that we have achieved in Malta protocols that can be utilized in other coastal environment for risk reduction and resilience improvement. And uh, uh, as landslide uh, experts or as let's say geomorphologists to study landslide, we would like uh, to, to combine as much as possible our outputs with those of uh, colleagues who study coastal erosion because uh, uh, these processes are really combined and uh, in play, interplay uh, quite significantly. Uh, okay, so maybe I think uh, I ask uh, our, our hosts if maybe it's time for a small break before giving the floor to Paola Corazza for the seventh, but not least, point of uh, this lecture, which is the integration of geomorphological mapping of terrestrial and marine, submarine areas. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Soldati, for uh, this uh, presentation. Um, yes, we may have uh, a break for 15 minutes be before uh, Professor Paula Coraggia starts uh, her uh, part. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay, okay. So then uh, see you, but I will be connected also at the end if there are any questions, so I will be there as well. Perfect. And meanwhile, uh, let me uh, remind to everybody that there are two links uh, at uh, the chat. Uh, the one is uh, to evaluate uh, the webinar. It is a questionnaire. And uh, the other one is uh, a link in order to um, ask for a certification of attendance if you need. Thank you. Thank you for, for letting us know. Okay. So can can you see the my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so um, good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you, um, Professor uh, Evelpidu, to um, let us uh, participate in this uh, um, event. Um, Mauro has uh, already told you um, uh, why um, the integration of land and sea. Um, data sets is uh, of a great uh, benefit um, in the context of uh, global environmental changes. Now I will focus my um, presentation on uh, geomorphological mapping of both uh, terrestrial and uh, uh, marine areas. And so I will show you example of um, um, terrestrial, uh, traditional terrestrial uh, map, geomorphological map and marine uh, geomorpholo geomorphological map, but I will show you also an example of an integrated geomorphological map of uh, emerge and the submerge um, area. And I will show you some example um, of maps that we have uh, developed, that our research group have developed, especially uh, in Malta, where uh, we have um, uh, extensively um, um, developed um, uh, research uh, during the last uh, decade. Um, so um, let's uh, have a look, a bit, uh, let's start with uh, the main concept of concerning the geomorphological mapping, um, which is a, a um, fundamental uh, activity um, within geosciences um, research. Uh, since geomorphological maps are an invaluable uh, tool, um, both of scientific uh, and of practical um, significance in terms of uh, fallout on uh, society. Um, a geomorphological map constitutes a, a strong um, scientific and uh, dynamic source of um, information on uh, landform, um, on their origin uh, and uh, on their uh, evolution, especially the uh, state, uh, the degree uh, of activity of the different uh, processes. And uh, um, um, of course, it can be uh, used to um, understand how uh, those lands form uh, combine in space and uh, in time to generate uh, landscape. 
um, the uh, two morphological maps constitutes um, the most uh, appropriate and um, how can say a synthetic uh, um, uh, way um, uh, of showing the spatial distribution of landform deposits, um, surface deposits, uh, uh, processes that act um, on landform and also um, time uh, of uh, uh, the action of these uh, processes. Um, a, um, um, a considerable amount of uh, information uh, can be uh, stored and can be uh, rapidly stored by geomorphological uh, mapping. Um, and this kind of document uh, um, uh, support and help us uh, to um, enhance the knowledge of the landscape uh, components uh, either before and after um, fieldwork. Uh, a large um, scale uh, geomorphological map um, um, include a, a great uh, variety, a great diversity of um, uh, data regarding uh, morpho morphometry, morphogenesis, uh, morphography, um, morphodynamics and chronology of uh, a given territory and give us also information about um, uh, lithology or, um, and the uh, geological uh, structures of uh, the territory. Moreover, very often um, the geomorphological map um, are enriched by um, in, in information, in attributes, uh, including uh, slopes, um, aspect, uh, soils, um, climate and vegetation. So uh, this kind of document is uh, uh, help us, uh, allow us to understand um, the history of, uh, um, uh, of the landscape. Of course, uh, um, uh, um, this uh, um, um, understanding, the good understanding of um, the various components, the various la landform and processes um, of uh, that component, uh, a landscape, uh, is essential uh, for the assessment, for its assessment, um, conservation, uh, protection and promotion, management, and of course, uh, planning. Um, the geomorphological mapping has um, um, a widespread and widely um, recognized application in land planning and um, territorial management, in environmental impact assessment, uh, in uh, um, hydraulic and geotechnical uh, engineering, in uh, also in the um, visualization and in communication of uh, scientific information. So um, this document, this kind of document is the starting point for uh, many applications and um, for the realization of uh, different uh, thematic maps. And there is a great abundance of uh, derived and applied uh, maps, such as the hazard maps or the nature conservation map, the geodiversity and the geoheritage map that um, show this uh, uh, importance um, clearly. Um, the, um, despite the, um, the great effort that uh, um, made for have uh, been made for a long in several countries in uh, toward the uh, setting up a um, standardized and uh, uh, mapping procedures and uh, legends um, uh, worldwide there is still uh, um, a great variety um, um, of uh, geomorphological legends uh, which different uh, um, differ um, uh, one from the other in the content, uh, uh, adopted symbols, uh, um, and scale of representation. Um, anyhow, there is a, um, a simple map with a certain uh, amount of community uh, in uh, and symbol definition that are produced both for um, uh, scientific and for um, apply uh, purposes. Uh, in this slide, you can see the um, uh, several examples, different examples of these uh, um, different geomorphological maps worldwide, produced worldwide. 
um, they, um, so the, the, in this sense, the geomorphological maps is a, 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 a valuable uh, tool, a valuable mean. Um, the, uh, the integration uh, of uh, emerge and uh, submerge geomorphological information is, um, as Mauro have already told you, is, um, extremely important, and in particular the uh, geomorphological mapping of uh, that combine that merge these um, two kind of um, data of land and uh, sea um, uh, can help us to um, um, uh, to understand uh, the relationship uh, between uh, lands form on land and. Uh, there is submarine uh, continuity. Um, they can help help us to um, uh, understand, to um, shed light on um, the genetic processes and on the potential um, uh, geohazards um, in, in a given territory and uh, um, um, give us a, 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 a complete, a comprehensive picture uh, of uh, the um, land landscape of the coastal landscape or more in general of this uh, um, very particular and uh, changing uh, environment. Um, anyhow, to date, um, a limited um, number of studies have integrated uh, terrestrial and uh, marine um, geomorphological mapping. Um, this is uh, um, due, um, this is, uh, um, this fact is um, reflect um, the differences in um, approach and uh, methodology, uh, methodologies apply to investigate uh, submarine and uh, with respect to the um, uh, on, onshore um, coastal areas. Um, especially um, regarding the, uh, the technical uh, limitation to map um, uh, offshore. Um, in fact, the, uh, the different accessibility um, and uh, the, the different uh, uh, investigation costs uh, are, um, consider, can be considered the main uh, causes for this uh, uh, great, uh, huge um, differences, huge disparity in uh, size and quality of uh, um, uh, data, um, uh, special data set uh, in, on terrestrial and marine um, data set used in uh, geomorphological uh, investigation. Um, the um, uh, lands form, landscape and lands form of uh, terrestrial and marine uh, area have been uh, traditionally uh, investigated um, independently. Um, and very often the, um, we, we, in the scientific literature, we, we can find uh, maps of um, the, uh, the sea. Uh, we uh, have just put some example of uh, morphology Morphological or body morphological um, maps of um, the, uh, the, 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 the submerged area. And uh, um, or we can find a lot of uh, um, several examples of um, traditional terrestrial um, geomorphological um, map. Um, in particular, in um, the, um, the, the um, taking advantages of the um, GIS and of the um, increasing availability of uh, uh, high resolution data and remote sensing uh, data, um, satellite uh, imagery, and all the uh, data set uh, such as the digital elevation model or the um, digital uh, terrain uh, models, a lot of of uh, geomorphological uh, map have been uh, produced um, and for many uh, um, um, emerge sector of uh, the earth surface. Um, so uh, there are several examples of uh, um, terrestrial uh, traditional um, uh, geomorphological map. I want to show you one of these examples, which is the um, map of the geomorphological map of the, the northwest coast um, of the highlands of uh, Malta. In Malta, in this um, map, um, the um, 
uh, the the um, the main information that we have that have been um, uh, repre reported are the uh, landform, in particular the landform uh, genesis, the distribution, uh, the morphometry, the state of activity, and uh, um, um, this kind of document uh, um, offer a, um, a vision, a dynamic vision of the uh, this um, the, the the coastal um, landscape. Um, in particular, uh, this uh, um, uh, map uh, follow the uh, um, uh, guidelines proposed the, uh, by the Italian um, Geological um, Survey, which has been recently updated, and uh, the um, lithology is um, represented by um, solid uh, colors, um, and the, the different uh, um, rocks are grouped um, according to the um, uh, age. Um, also, the uh, tectonic uh, um, elements uh, are represented and are represented with the lines and uh, uh, symbols uh, um, in the light um, brown. Um, and uh, um, in, uh, also, the hydrography is represented in uh, light blue. Uh, the, um, the geomorphological, uh, um, uh, the landform, and uh, all the associated uh, um, deposits are um, represented, are depicted uh, using uh, symbols of uh, different colors. Uh, according to the um, geomorphological uh, processes that led to the genesis. Um, and so, um, for example, with the um, red, we have, uh, we represent, we depict the um, 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 gravity uh, induced landform with uh, the green color with represent a fluvial and uh, um, a fluvial landform and the landform due to running water. Um, the cast landform are depicted with um, the orange uh, colors and, and so on. Um, also, the uh, state of activity uh, is uh, um, represented and is uh, marked by me means of uh, color um, intensity. And uh, so, um, for example, for uh, the landslide, a, 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 an intense red represents active landslide, where um, a, a light um, red represents inactive um, landslide. Um, the, uh, if we have a look to this uh, uh, map, um, uh, we can uh, analyze the different uh, uh, kind of uh, um, landform and processes that affect um, this area. Um, Maura have already uh, told you, um, talk about the different uh, um, type of landslide that affect, that largely affect this, um, the northwestern uh, coast of Malta, um, and uh, in um, with different uh, symbols and patterns. Um, um, the, uh, these landslides, the different uh, type of landslides are uh, represented in the map. So we have um, rock spread, block slide, uh, earth flow, but we have also map um, um, with a, um, a single symbol, a punti for symbol, also unmappable um, uh, landslides. Um, with the um, orange color, um, we have represented the uh, karst um, features that are uh, quite common in, uh, in Malta. And uh, um, there are um, both uh, small scale uh, surface features uh, that uh, um, characterize, that are, affect widely the, um, uh, the limestone um, plateau, but there are also um, 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 caves. Um, and uh, uh, sinkholes um, that have been depicted with a um, particular um, symbol. Um, the, concerning the coastal um, uh, landform, um, the, um, um, the, 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 the different uh, um, landform and uh, um, deposit, coastal deposits have been represented with the um, blue in, in color, and um, in particular, the, uh, the base are um, characterized by the presence of um, sandy beach of um, 
um, small, small, uh, usually small sandy beaches, and uh, um, while there are also um, uh, um, cliffs, um, uh, the headlands are dominated uh, by cliffs, and uh, um, sometimes these cliffs are um, associated with the shore platforms, uh, which are um, represented, depicted in, in the map, and uh, sometimes uh, these vertical uh, cliffs uh, uh, are um, um, without, um, uh, with no presence of uh, shore platforms, uh, and uh, are um, depicted as well in in the map. Uh, concerning the uh, anthropogenic uh, landform, the um, this sector of the uh, island um, is uh, um, 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 has been. Um, slightly affected by human impact, especially if we compare to the rest of the island. But some um, uh, touristic uh, structures and um, uh, small uh, quarries, inactive uh, quarries and um, dumping sites have been um, represented with the um, blue, uh, um, uh, black uh, color. Um, so, um, we have seen uh, an example of uh, um, a terrestrial, uh, traditional terrestrial um, uh, geomorphological map, but uh, as I uh, told you before, um, the scientific community used to work on land uh, or uh, at sea independently. Now we can, uh, I want to show you an example of um, um, a kind of, uh, an example of marine um, geomorphological map. In particular, I um, will show you um, the uh, geomorphological map of the seafloor north um, uh, east uh, of the seafloor of the, 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 the northeast portion of the um, uh, um, seafloor or again of the Maltese uh, island. This map is uh, at uh, one uh, to um, 500, 5,000 uh, scale uh, map and this uh, um, drop over a, a five uh, meter resolution digital um, terrain model. Um, the, um, um, uh, the map um, as, uh, um, was compiled uh, following uh, the uh, integration um, and the, the, the analysis and interpretation of different uh, um, high resolution or several high resolution um, seafloor uh, uh, bathymetry uh, data sets and uh, um, uh, structural um, features, uh, coastal. Um, and marine landform and anthropogenic uh, features have been uh, mapped. Um, the, uh, again, the uh, symbology uh, follow the uh, guidelines proposed by the um, Italian uh, geological uh, surveys and uh, again the landform um, and all the associated deposits are um, um, representing using uh, different colors according to the um, geomorphological uh, processes that, that led to the genesis. Um, the um, research um, was carried out um, based on um, the analysis, the geomorphological analysis and uh, interpretation of um, different of several um, um, high resolution uh, data sets, in particular to, um, thanks to the uh, a two um, meter resolution um, uh, um, uh, multi-beam bathymetry and acoustic bed scatter uh, acquired in uh, um, during uh, two um, cruises in 2009 and 2011 and 10 meter resolution sonar bathymetry and uh, um, a one meter resolution uh, digital elevation model from um, bathymetric LiDAR survey in uh, carry out in uh, 2012. The uh, digital elevation models uh, um, were merged uh, into a, um, a single uh, digital elevation model of 5-meter resolution, and the um, 
the, the data, the spatial data were uh, then uh, stored in a, a GIS uh, and for the representation and uh, uh, the of the uh, identify um, uh, uh, geomorphological features. Um, the uh, most common lens form of uh, uh, this uh, um, sector of uh, the seafloor was again the, the structural um, the, 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 the structural lens form the lens form that are um, controlled by the um, geological uh, structures of the um, archipelago. So, um, a, a north, um, west, southeast um, oriented escarpment uh, um, uh, probably controlled by the, um, uh, the, the full system parallel to the uh, Pantelleria. Um, uh, bounds um, uh, offshore the investigated um, uh, continental uh, shelf and uh, um, this uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, escarpment uh, change its uh, uh, orientation um, and uh, um, um, becoming uh, and become more fragmented um, than in, in, uh, in the uh, northern segment. Um, also, um, concerning the coastal and marine um, um, landfall, um, we have mapped different uh, uh, levels of uh, um, terraces um, oriented north, uh, west, southeast again. Um, and uh, um, they are characterized by um, superplanar um, morphology. Um, and uh, uh, they have been um, uh, interpreted as a um, paleo shore platform analogous to the um, current uh, um, shore platform uh, in the Globigerina um, limestone located uh, along the, uh, the coast. Um, active, uh, other active uh, um, marine lands form uh, include also uh, a contrite uh, deposits and uh, a, um, a, a ripple, um, um, ripple marks um, um, orient, um, um, related to the uh, currents um, um, of the, uh, on the shelf. Um, fluvial lands form are also um, very well um, widespread in uh, um, in the area, and um, um, a, 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 a series of uh, um, channel um, uh, oriented uh, channel characterized by a U shape um, uh, cross section um, uh, um, delimited by a vertical um, um, vert sub vertical walls characterize the um, uh, the continental shelf. Um, very often these uh, um, uh, channels are um, um, clearly connected with the uh, terrestrial um, valleys um, and uh, um, this kind of uh, channel have been interpreted as um, relict uh, fluvial um, valleys um, uh, related to um, the um, continental drainage system of uh, um, the, the island. Uh, also, uh, karst and uh, gravity-induced um, um, deposits, um, um, the gravity-induced uh, deposit was um, um, small and isolated, um, were also uh, mapped. But uh, we have said that um, it's uh, uh, of paramount importance to uh, um, um, try to integrate uh, the um, 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 marine and the uh, terrestrial um, data sets. And uh, um, um, especially um, um, this kind of uh, document uh, that uh, integrate both uh, this uh, information uh, um, give us a, 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 a complete picture of this um, environment. Um, but the, um, there are uh, some uh, differences um, and some um, um, problems uh, between the difference between uh, terrestrial and um, 
marine geomorphological um, uh, maps and uh, um, that make difficult to integrate uh, the uh, representation um, uh, of land and seafloor um, um, together. Uh, these uh, um, differences uh, and uh, are um, mainly related to the representation um, scale. Uh, the terrestrial geomorphological uh, maps are more um, easily drawn at uh, a fine, um, a fine scale um, than um, the submerged um, geomorphological maps because of the higher um, uh, facility, the higher uh, ease um, of um, data collection on land that. Um, than underwater. Another problem, another difference uh, is the standardized terminology um, uh, and the classification scheme. Um, the uh, terrestrial uh, lens form are um, codified um, more or less at the international uh, level and uh, um, their definition and um, their representation are generally um, shared um, uh, either um, worldwide, worldwide or um, uh, country-wide. Uh, um, for the um, um, submarine landform, this is um, this, um, this is not uh, is not uh, the same. Um, in fact, the uh, um, submarine landform um, um, are, um, for the um, submarine landform are use uh, different uh, terms and uh, classification schemes. So there are no um, a common um, 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 terminology um, apart from the uh, main physiographic uh, classification. Uh, another problem is uh, um, the problem related to, to the standardized symbology. Uh, for the terrestrial um, uh, geomorphological uh, mapping, um, more or less there is a, a standard um, symbols that are uh, codified. Um, uh, while this is mm, there, there are a lack a lacking uh, for uh, submarine um, geomorphological uh, mapping and uh, uh, for integrated um, um, uh, ter terrestrial and sub submarine geomorphological mapping. Uh, recently, um, a few attempts have been um, uh, made to um, um, overcome uh, this critical issue and some example of uh, integrated um, um, uh, maps of lands and um, some marine data sets um, have been uh, published recently in, in literature, especially uh, um, by the uh, Italian scientific um, community. Um, um, again, another um, um, difference, another uh, problem is those related to the coverage of lithological and uh, chronological information in the terrestrial um, environment. The coverage of lithological and um, uh, chronological data is um, generally much higher than uh, for the seafloor. Um, we have a lot. Uh, um, we have uh, the, the, there is a, uh, there is a greater variability of. Uh, uh, maps of digital terrain models uh, of data sets um, if we compare to the um, um, to the sea floor. Um, um, and the last but not least um, problem, the last but not least difference um, um, is related to the um, uh, acquiring the elevation uh, data in marine regions that um, create a um, uh, problem that poses significant uh, um, challenges and um, very often uh, important limitation and uh, uh, which make more complex the um, process um, than uh, of acquiring um, data than in the emerge uh, system. 
but um, some I, I told you that some examples, some effort has been uh, done in uh, recently in order to produce um, in such kind of um, uh, valuable um, document, a single comprehensive document of both the terrestrial and marine areas, and this. Uh, um, map is uh, uh, an example of this kind of document it is uh, uh, the uh, integrated geomorphological uh, map of the terrestrial marine areas of uh, Ghent, the northern Malta and uh, uh, Comino and it uh, at 1 to 25,000 uh, scale. Um, this map is the results of both terrestrial and uh, marine uh, analysis of different uh, um, types of um, uh, data um, such aerial photos, uh, digital terrain models and um, of the seafloor and also uh, acoustic bed scatter um, image. The, um, this uh, document emphasizes the, um, um, the relationship and the uh, continuity um, of geomorphological features uh, of both on land and, um, um, and, on, and sea on sea and uh, um, led to outline the uh, evolu evolution of this, uh, um, of this uh, area. Um, in this uh, map, um, uh, fluvial um, um, cast um, and gravity induced landform, both on land and uh, on the sea floor, have been um, depicted. Um, in, in particular, the, um, the research um, have uh, um, include uh, analysis of uh, um, multiple um, uh, data, of, uh, several type um, of um, data of uh, an high resolution digital elevation model of uh, um, multi uh, beam uh, bathymetry LIDAR uh, lens elevation and field um, survey was um, carried out. Out, uh, um, and also in the interpretation of uh, aerial um, photos. Um, the morphometric analysis of uh, um, bathymetry um, was carried out in order to for the identification of um, uh, any um, variation, any small uh, variation in, um, in the uh, morphology, in the seafloor uh, morphology. Um, mm, the, the, the texture analysis uh, of um, the acoustic uh, bed scatter image was um, um, realized in order to uh, classify, automatically uh, classify the, the type of sediment um, covering the um, seafloor. And um, for the areas, um, um, uh, were surveyed um, 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 through bathymetric lidar was where no acoustic bed scatter was available. Uh, also, uh, sea floor um, uh, substrate and morphology were uh, inferred through um, geomorphological interpretation um, and comparison with um, seafloor maps uh, available in literature. So a very um, comprehensive and uh, complex um, uh, research. Um, so the, the, the output of outputs of this um, research, of this analysis and interpretation was, were stored in a, um, a, in a GIS for the representation of the uh, geomorphological features. Uh, the, um, the symbols um, follow um, the guidelines of the Italian uh, geological um, survey. And uh, in, in particular, since the, um, the land and the uh, sea um, uh, scape are interrelated, uh, the submerged landform and uh, of terrestrial um, uh, origin were um, represented um, with the same 
symbols um, as um, they are on uh, on uh, on land, uh, but with different uh, tones. So um, you can see that we have um, um, the the um, uh, the same color, but with a, a different uh, shade, a different uh, uh, tones for um, uh, represent, for example, um, um, cast landform, gravity induced landform, as well as um, fluvial um, landform. Um, this um, help us to um, highlight um, the um, continuity on landform uh, above and uh, below um, the uh, present day uh, sea level. Um, so um, uh, mass movements uh, um, were uh, depicted, and uh, in particular, the emerge portion of um, block slide have been uh, considered uh, active, while any submerged um, landslide deposit have been um, uh, considered inactive and depicted as inactive, since there are um, no uh, monitoring data. Uh, available concerning the um, cast uh, features um, um, these are well um, developed uh, in both upper um, and lower coralline limestone uh, formation and uh, there are cast uh, um, pavement and small scale um, features that affect both uh, the um, um, plateau surface and um, also the um, submerge um, bedrock uh, outcrops. Um, there are a few collapse sinkholes uh, um, quaternary in age that occur both on, uh, um, um, uh, on land and uh, there are a, a number of bedrock uh, um, collapse uh, sinkholes also uh, in, um, on the continental um, shelf. And uh, again, concerning the um, the, 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 the fluvial, the main fluvial landform. Uh, these, uh, as uh, I already told you before, for the uh, marine uh, geomorphological maps, they um, consist especially of uh, valleys uh, carved with, uh, within um, um, limestone bedrock and form a, um, a gorgeous um, a network of, of, um, um, of incision um, uh, both uh, inland and um, uh, offshore. Um, the uh, submerged um, uh, uh, channel um, our channels are um, being interpreted as um, relict um, fluvial uh, valleys, uh, and they are the result of uh, uh, fluvial processes that uh, developed uh, um, during uh, um, different stages of uh, sea level uh, fall when uh, more humid um, uh, condition uh, allow the water course to um, uh, cut. Um, uh, the, the, the gorges and um, uh, allow the, the, the deposition to de deposit um, the, the sediment. Um, so um, the, uh, this, this kind of uh, document of single comprehensive um, um, map um, show um, the, uh, the, um, that the most of um, lands form characterizing uh, the uh, seafloor uh, develop in a, a subaerial environment and were, and were successfully success, successively uh, drawn by um, uh, post um, uh, glacial sea level rise. So uh, the um, um, the integration um, of terrestrial and uh, marine uh, investigation uh, is uh, um, crucial uh, for uh, a better comprehension of uh, the geomorphological um, evolution of a given uh, area, uh, um, especially in um, in changing uh, environment. Um, Thank you very much for your attention. We, um, I don't know if we have time, but if you want, we have time for um, some question.
So if there are no questions, have a nice day and uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Thank you very much, Professor Mauro Soldati and Paula, Professor Paula Coranza for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Mauro, your microphone. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to the organizers for having invited us. Uh, thank you for the audience uh, for their patience. Uh, and uh, I question one. Maybe there is one question. Shall I answer? Question one from the measurement you've been taking those years, have you noticed any pattern regarding rock movement monitoring in Angkor Bay or in other places that reveal? Um, or implies seasonality, cyclicity. Yes, I, uh, I very briefly mentioned this because uh, the time available was not enough. Um, we have uh, fissurimeters um, on the um, big plateau above uh, Papai village. <clears throat> and there, um, and it's a slab of rock of about 15 to 20 meters overlying uh, Mars and clays. And, um, and uh, we uh, we realized that um, with the fissurimeters collecting data day by day because they are automatic fissurimeters and they took uh, uh, measurement three times a day uh, that they were somehow not so clear uh, evidently due to the type of rocks but uh, there were some cyclicity uh, related to the wet and uh, dry season so the wet season uh, would be like autumn and winter and the dry season spring and summer so we understood in the graphs uh, according to the graphs we understood that there should be a certain cyclicity that is somehow linked to the expansion and shrinking of um, uh, the clays beneath uh, uh, the upper coralline limestones and this uh, favors uh, that tilting backward and forward of uh, the rock blocks even when or where there is not a forward movement of the blocks so that means that the blocks are moving even if they are not advancing toward the coast uh, then there is a question about the presentation. If this will be posted on the CV's web page, um, this depends on the organizers. If uh, this is going to be done also for the other webinars, we are available to provide uh, <coughs> a PDF of our presentation. Uh, all uh, CV's webinars so far uh, have been uh, recorded, so they will be posted on the web page of uh, CV's. At least we will send it to the CV's uh, web page. I don't know when they will uh, upload, but uh, it will be sent. Okay, thank you. I do not see other questions on the chat. But then if any of you is interested in any specific topic, uh, uh, the presentation, you have uh, our addresses anyway. Anyhow, if you Google my name or uh, Paola Corazza's name on the web, you can find us at the University of Modena in Reggio Emilia, Italy, and you can ask uh, for materials, uh, papers, uh, or whatever you cannot find on, on the web.
Okay, if we don't have any uh, additional uh, question, then uh, we may uh, finalize the webinar here and uh, wish you a uh, nice uh, weekend and uh, keep well and safe. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye.